Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Megan McClenahan. I'm a first year MBA and MS in engineering student here at MIT Sloan, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to the driving business analytics with sports, sorry, driving business decisions with sports analytics panel. Starting furthest from me, our moderator will be Seth Walder. He is an analytics writer at ESPN. Doris Dave is the senior VP of customer data strategy at the NBA. Paul Sabin is an analytics specialist at ESPN. And Vikram Somaya is the senior VP of global data operations officer and ad platforms at ESPN. The panel will be 40 minutes and we'll have five minutes at the end for Q&A. If you have any good questions, please feel free to tweet them using the hashtag driving decisions and the moderator will choose the best ones to put up. With that, I'll hand it over to Seth. Thank you, Megan. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Today, like Megan said, we're talking about sort of the intersection of two areas that I think most people think of as very separate, sports analytics and business analytics, but there is in fact quite a bit of overlap and specifically talking about how sports analytics can influence business decisions. So, Paul, I want to start with you. In your work at ESPN, you're primarily working in sports analytics, building predictive models that are mainly used for a content purpose. What, what's the business purpose for do, that sort of work? Um, there's actually a lot of things that you could talk about in the business perspective. But for example, you know, ESPN, we're a media company. Um, we want to give fans what they want, and so, you know, sports analytics, oftentimes, you know, we do a lot of power ratings, predictions, um, probabilities that teams are going to get to a certain point in the season, make the playoffs, et cetera. And we want to be pushing the teams that are going to be good. Um, so in that sense, we do a lot of, you know, helping out programming with, okay, we think these teams are, are the good teams this year. This is what the data tells us. This is, you know, in our past how, how accurate we are. And, and this might be a surprise team that maybe last year they weren't good, but this year they're, they're going to be better, and, and fans are going to want to watch this team play. So that's probably the, the biggest influence um, intersection with sports analytics that I have done. And TV decisions are actually made based on that sort of, that sort of information? Yeah, TV decisions are made. Um, you know, that's not the only thing that they factor into it. Um, but you can, you know, I've done a little bit of work with a programming team and building models that incorporate not only sports analytics and things like that, but also just basic business decisions and um, historical Nielsen data and other things like that. So Doris, Paul's talking obviously about the programming impact of yeah. predictive models. In your work at the NBA, is that, do you guys do similar work to influence marketing and what kind of, yeah. what can you decide based on that? Yeah, we're, um, we're very much uh, in startup mode as we think about customer data um, strategy at the league. Um, it's a function that's existed now for about 18 months or so. And really our role is to get a single view of that fan and figure out how to capitalize on the fact that the league has about a billion worldwide fans, this incredible footprint, particularly outside the US. We have to be able to harness and understand, like in any other industry, who are these fans? Um, how do we appeal to them? How do we become a lot more known to them? And how do we make that fan known to us? And it's all about personalization in the space and the more times that we can outreach to them in the places where they're interacting with the NBA, leveraging the right content and leveraging all the data that we have on that fan to marry the content up with who that fan is. We're gonna win in the marketplace, especially as the, as the media landscape kind of changes over the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Vikram, if I understand correctly, that sort of overlaps with a lot of the work that you do. How, how does that relate? Yeah, I mean, it's super similar, right? Um, my team focuses on a couple of things. One, we do almost exactly what Doris just described around understanding the ESPN fan. Um, much the same way, we have a pretty dedicated fan core, and we have a lot of information on them. That's one of the advantages we have being in the digital space and now increasingly being in the TV space as well. Um, we are also beginning to realize that the ecosystem that surrounds us, even in social, now wants to do a lot more horse trading around understanding how we can share information for perhaps the first time. Um, but then we take a lot of that information, and in my case, we actually utilize it across a couple of different categories. 
Um, we've had a few years uh, to sort of figure out some of the ways that we can utilize them the best way. One is obviously just to create products for ad sales, to think about how we can actually combine that with what marketers are looking for. Uh, and there are some pretty unique utilities that we've built there that we can talk about as we get into it. But we also think about how does that work for our distribution. When we think about how sports and the evolution of sports education and how content is consumed is changing, we have to think about the ways that we can actually speak to those consumers in completely new modalities, right? And how do we do that? How do we provide the folks who are beginning to understand those notions, who are working with the MVPDs like Comcast or the DMVPDs like YouTube, uh, to figure out how our content is best utilized and sort of where do we get the best deal, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, how do we market to them in a way that makes sense, right? How do we speak to them with the same sense of authenticity that ESPN is known for, but find ways, to Doris's point, to personalize the message in a way that does not feel creepy, but that feels appropriate, right, and timely. So if you get a sense of the fan, right, you get the sense of the consumer, what, what is it that you can learn about them and then What's an example? What can you do with that when you actually try and figure out who this person is and what they want? Yeah. Um, I mean, a tiny, a small, small, small example. You know, we call it progressive profiling, but it's this notion of what are the relevant pieces of information uh, to get from a fan, both implicit and explicit preferences, as we continue down the path of knowing who they are. You know, one of the biggest things for us is understanding a fan's favorite team or, or their favorite player, especially in the international markets. And what we find is the predict, uh, predictability of having that information, whether in fact you actually use the fact that LeBron James is, is that fan's favorite player or not, um, there's a factor of five, 10, sometimes 15 times lift that you see in just the fact that that fan has interacted with you and given you that information. But being able to use those types of variables then, whether we're going back out and talking to them about OTT streaming, or a, a game that might be in town next weekend in their local market or, or, or merchandising business. Um, it's some really powerful stuff that can help you target, you know, not just your content, but your message, and frankly then how to use the teams and the players themselves and the fact that they're now out in the ecosystem in social in an extremely powerful way. How do we use that and bring it all together and harness that for the fan? I think I'd like to say we've We've taken that notion and we've blown it out a little bit. So let me talk about a product that we pushed into the market about two years ago. It was called Live Connect Hot. And it essentially said, we have a bunch of really interesting data assets at ESPN. How do we use them to talk to these fans in a new way? So we said, we have about 40 million people who've come on our site or come to us in some way and given us player information, league information, stuff that they like around sports, right? So we have a bunch of specific attributes around them. We then have about another 70 million where we ran content consumption models. And we started to look at what are you consuming across ESPN, and can we take that information and then begin to make smart guesses about which category to put you in in terms of your player preferences or league preferences. And we, you know, we reached about 100, 110 million folks that we could fairly well identify what leagues or sports or games they identified with. We then said, all right, that's interesting. What else could we do at ESPN that nobody else can do? And what we can do is we then went out and taxonomized every single type of live game that existed, right? And we said within those games, so just take an NFL game for instance, what are all the categories of interesting events that we can code in real time? So somebody got hurt, somebody scored, there was a turnaround, whatever. We then have about 700, 800 categories within each of those games that, that then become potentially commercially relevant and that we're recording in real time across all sports. Nobody else can do that. So, so that was the second set of assets. And then the third piece we looked at was emotional response. And we said, if something is happening in a game and we know that somebody is a fan of that team and it's at some point in the course of the season, how are they reacting right now to what's happening? We know how plugged in fans tend to be, right? They know what's happening in real time. They're watching it, they're listening to it, they're watching the tweets, they're watching the highlights. Um, and we said, can we then marry that with what marketers are trying to do in terms of speaking to them? And we started building correlated models. And we started seeing some really, really interesting things. So in a hotly anticipated game, if an insurance company came out and started to talk about its insurance products right before the game started, they actually did significantly better in beginning to open an engagement with those fans because that was the state that those particular fans were in. And we had to find the fans of those teams in that particular state 
of those 100 million that we could push that message out to. And we've then done that across a variety of different, essentially, emotional states. Happiness, joy, anticipation, disgust. There's been a whole bunch of interesting ones. Uh, and all of them map to what we built around the ad technology space, which was essentially a creative model that could push whatever the right ad was for that moment. So essentially, we're taking all these real-time signals, an understanding of those consumers, an understanding of time and place, and we're linking it to revenue. Thanks. I think, uh, Vikram, uh, that's really interesting how you can do all that. But you know, it's kind of back to our, our panel here is, you know, how do we know which games are going to be those games where fans are really uh, you know, nervous or you know, uptight and that we're going to push some of these things? And that's where you know, sports analytics obviously can come into play. Um, and then you talked about the NBA is like really specific where like the players drive so much of fan interest and it's unique in that way with, with other sports maybe. People follow their, their local team like baseball. You know, I don't watch a baseball game because Mike Trout is playing, um, but people who watch the Yankees no matter if they're good or bad. And so you know, there's a combination of, of those things that you always have to you know, dive into. Like if a, if a game is important and you know, three months from now we might be able to look at games in three months that probably are gonna swing the playoffs. And that might be something that you can use sports analytics to do, and then you can use some of these models that Vikram's talking mm -hmm. about and kind of meld the two, and you know, three months out, you can go to an advertiser and say, hey, and this is going to be a big uh, event, and you know, your product is probably gonna do well on, on this date. I have to ask Vikram if before an evenly contested game, people buy insurance, why? Yeah, and sometimes what, what, what is the engagement metric for the insurance companies can vary, right? Like they went to the site, and then later on they came back, right? Very often there's a look-through window that's 30 days, and they look at what they did before that 30 days, and you know, attribution in the advertising industry is a strange and unnatural thing. Um, so we all have to build models to say, here's the contribution that we, we potentially could have made. But in some ways, the other thing that we're doing there is creating an ID graph, right? When you think about the most powerful identity companies in the world, the Googles, the Facebooks, who understand what folks are doing, what we're doing is essentially building a sports filter around a person, mm -hmm. right? And saying, how do we create a smarter profile of this person, a better understanding of how their sports interests are evolving? Because when you think about what ESPN needs to understand, we know the fan is evolving. We know that their habits are changing. We know that their needs are different. We know that their expectations about what they pay for this and how they pay for this are different. And we're trying to address each one of those. We have a you know, very profitable, very, very powerful business through cable. We stream sports. We're now examining direct-to-consumer and figuring out sort of what does that look like for us. And we know that there will be other models down the road. And we want to understand, we know that there's a finite number of people in the world, right? And if we know something about all of them, we begin to understand how we can give them what they need before they know they need it. I, I couldn't agree more with, with Vikram. I, I think um, I, I come from outside the sports industry, and it's, you know, when you think about performance marketing and uh, marketing and delighting customers, it's all about understanding the customer at the customer level. Um, and I think we tend to talk about platforms, you know, social or the website, and we tend to talk about content but it's how do those things collide and manifest to the customer? And if you start to shape your analytics based on understanding the customer, um, meaning their, their full persona and their life and their household and their likes and their dislikes and their spending and their share of wallet and all those other things, um, how they spend their money on entertainment, um, all of those things become extremely powerful factors then in, in how you market specifically the NBA, whether, again, it, it's, the, it's the live game itself or you know, attending the game or, or a league pass product. All of those things kind of fit into a much broader life that that, that fan is having. I want to ask about content, brought it up at the, at the beginning. You know, we think of sports analytics there's certainly great tools for teams, but for media companies like ESPN and leagues like the NBA, sports analytics can lead to a lot of content. You know, as fans, there's a lot of people that enjoy that. Is there an actual dollars and cents benefit of creating that sort of content? And please say yes, because it's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to start? Sure. Uh, there's no question that the answer is yes. I think that what we're trying to understand right now, and it's a little bit similar to what, what Vikram described, is we have this data repository of fan records that, that's growing every single day. 
our ability to start segmenting, and actually one of our data scientists is here, um, actually starting to segment our fans and really understanding how did they come to us, what are the journeys that they're taking throughout their life with the NBA, not just at the league, but with their local team and in, in the market where they are. Um, understanding the various pieces of content that are being consumed and on what platforms, and frankly, how do we use those opportunities and how do they build up to things like buying your first jersey or attending your first game or you know, one day you're a best customer, you're a core fan, and now you're buying a, a streaming package for a year, which is a $200 investment. At that point, you've kind of married the league. So we're really trying to understand all of those pivot points and how to leverage content in a much smarter way where we're marrying content with the distribution channel that that fan is consuming it on with the fan themselves and what we know about them. I think one interesting uh, problem that maybe isn't, you know, we, we, tr we can track fans, right? And um, these two people have, you know, they're in their jobs, they track fans, they try to segment fans and, and know what their interests are, but fans change, right? So. I know, I know personally, like, um, you know, I grew up in the D.C. area, and I was a Cal Ripken, Baltimore Orioles fan, right? Well, how do you know who's going to be a Washington Nationals fan when, when they're created? And, you know, amongst my friends, like, we're split 50-50. Like, some people are like, oh, you know, I'm still an Orioles true fan, and I'm like, well, you know, I grew up in D.C., so I'll, I kind of switch allegiances. And kind of being able to understand fans, we can see in the past how they've... Um, progressed. Um, I think one interesting problem that, you know, we can, going forward, people need to look at is predicting how fans are going to change in the future. Um, we know that people like LeBron James, and so when he switches teams, we can probably assume safely that, you know, all these people that were Cavaliers fans in 2010, a lot of them probably switched and became Miami Heat fans, and they went Those back to the Cavaliers fans. And next year, you know, who knows? Which team is going to be the most popular? Um, but you know, like the NBA is very unique and like that, unique like that. So Bryce Harper and Steven Strasburg had nothing to do with your decision. Uh, I like them when they stunk, and they're probably going to stink in two years again. So I'll, I'll stick with them. But those notions of following those journeys across multiple teams, across sort of new ways that fans are evolving, how they think about what fandom actually means. If you're not tracking it to begin with, you don't understand the journey with any sense of real depth. So I think what a lot of us are doing now is sort of we have the tools, it's economically feasible to begin to understand how these journeys work. And then the applications are almost endless, right? It can become content. Um, I mean, we were talking to a content company yesterday that actually it does two things. It translates earnings reports into written articles without editorial oversight. And it also generates for another company their fantasy emails with a high index on trash talking, right? Completely automated, right? So, I mean, what AI could become as we get deeper and deeper into here is the pool of data you're working with, and then here are the, the behaviors that you can teach a machine to actually commit. I mean, it starts to get pretty scary pretty quickly, right? So as we think about the infrastructure that we're building, we're building data warehouses, we're building George Lima, who's sitting out there for ESPNs, building ours. We, but there's a ton of work that we're doing to just build foundations that we can then do interesting things with. Because the tools are now like cars. We don't have to know how to drive, like how it all works. We just have to know we can drive them, right? And that's a very different place from where data science was even 10 years ago. Do, do you guys think that there are areas of sports analytics that sports teams use and are you know tools that are available, but are underutilized in the sort of business sector. You can say no. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a bunch of stuff that's sitting on the floor, yeah, right? I mean, exactly. Doris and I were talking about the fact that yeah. we don't do enough work together to figure out how to, you know, our fans are the same fans, right? How do we think about how that information is utilized across all of our organizations to create an experience for them that is bigger and better? Um, you know, live sports is the last bastion of live viewing. Right, of unified live viewing. This is a communal experience. How do we give them the information they need in an age when now they're coming to expect it? How do we give them personalization in an age when they're coming to expect it? How do we cater to the fact that everybody has a slightly different take on how they want to view something, but when they view it communally, what is that unified experience like? Right? And that's what we're all sort of spinning around to try and understand, make sure we're tracking with 
how the world is changing around us and what an older sports fan might feel like versus what a millennial might feel like about how they want to process sport. I think in general, the sports industry, whether teams or businesses, has been a, maybe a little lagging behind the tech industry when it comes to using data. And you know, I think these two people sitting beside me are great testaments of that it's changing. And there are people in sports that have great data knowledge, and they're implementing it, and they're using it in the business. Um, sports teams are using data more than they ever used to. Um, so I'm sure there's lots of uh, things that businesses are trying to do. And one of the things that we've talked a lot about in the industry recently is you know, customization for fans, um, not just like digitally, but you know, in broadcasts as well. Um, you know, can, we, can we customize content in a broadcast for two different fan bases that are watching the same game? Right. I mean, on Advanced TV, we're going to do it this year, right? So for the first time, we're going to start experimenting with what it looks like when you get a specific feed to your home. Um, and the TV industry is going to evolve into a new space around that. They've seen where digital has gone. The expectations from the fans around what content they can consume, can consume, it's a pipe as far as they're concerned. So how do we sort of make sure that that experience is all that it can be? There will be a lot of change in that. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, it would be naive if we're truly going to take a fan-centric approach over yeah. the next five or 10 years and you believe that consumer is going to be king in this ecosystem. <clears throat> Today, they really, they haven't been for the last five to 10 years. They're tethered in a lot of ways to the, um, to the, you know, uh, the powers that be around the channel that they need to watch the game on mm -hmm. or, you know, having 10 um, versions of OTT and figuring out which is gonna, gonna be the one that's gonna be most economical but get them what they want. It would be naive to think to Vikram's point that any team or league or media company can operate as a vac in a vacuum or as an entity by themselves. Because mm -hmm. um, again, that fan is, is consuming all over the place and the only way you get a single view is to be able to, to marry it up and put it together in a way that um, we start partnering around data and what that means so that whether the customer or the fan is consuming on Bleacher Report or on NBA.com, um, again, if we know who that person is, that we're customizing content and doing it in a way that's relevant to the journey that they're having. Let me ask the inverse of the question. You guys come from a, a business background. Are there tools? Are there techniques? Are there any sort of analysis that you see in the business world that could be applied to the sports world, but is, you don't see it as much? You know, I was talking to Vikram backstage, and he was giving me an example of, of his last job at the Weather Channel. And uh, you know, he'd say, oh, you know, this is what the data says. And they ask why, and then you can correct me, right? Well, that's what the data says. And I think in sports, people don't like that answer. You know, well, that's just what the data says. Well, well why? People want to know, well, why does the data say that? Why, why you know, is shooting, you know, long twos in most situations not always the optimal choice? Um, and once you understand it, great. But I think in sports, oftentimes with artificial intelligence, neural networks, and things like that, there's a lot of tools that are really difficult to explain, um, but they give good answers. And you know, I think sports has evolved, but I think still has a ways to go. Of Maybe not every question can be answered perfectly with a why, but you can have evidence that it is the right answer. And hopefully, that'll be accepted more in the future. Yeah, I th think that. Um I think over the, you know, it's sort of remaining humble in the space, which I think is hard to do when you're in sports because the product is so damn good <laughs> yeah. that it sells itself. So like if you're the Cavs and you've got LeBron or, you know, you're the Knicks and you've got Porzingis, um, you know, you're selling out an arena, you know, knock on wood because the league's doing great. But it, it does make it then, there, there's a fair amount of kind of cultural shift in sort of how do you strike while the iron's hot? Mm -hmm. Like we're doing great, but how do we make it even more data driven and take it to a place in the future, five, 10 years where things are gonna look different? And I think sometimes it's hard for people to react to that change when you're not living it in the moment. And I find that the sports industry, it's, it's very, um, there's, there's something going on every single day. So people are very focused on the next game, the next week, the next season, um, which I think, you know, it makes it hard to insert some of the elements around data, particularly the tooling and the human capital. You know, some of the capabilities and the investments are, are for the long haul, and they, and they take years to really embed in the DNA of, of a company.
That, that's a really great point. It is, it's a fundamentally different way of functioning that technology companies have been using for a long time, which is a lot of the upfront investment is upfront, right? You've got to take a risk on this stuff, but you've also got to build a framework for testing it because the data will say different things depending on what question you ask it, right? So partially, it is you've got to ask it a bunch of questions and then triangulate to the answer that really is going to matter for you. And that takes familiarity with it, and that takes time, and it takes talent. And the same talent is being used to drive every other industry you can imagine, whether it's curing cancer or you know, serving an ad to the right person. It's the same people. So the pool of folks that we are going after to begin to understand this, to use those tools in the most effective way, is limited. Right? And you know, STEM is doing what it is doing in America. Um, so we continue to sort of work on that piece, which is to bring in the right kinds of people, educate them either in the semantic of sport or in the semantic of data. You've got to get one. You've got to get both eventually. And, and realize that your job in the future is going to require both those things in this industry. It's just a matter of time. I think one other thing is time frame. So sports teams often don't think long term. They think here and now, when, when now. Uh, businesses, you know, if they sacrifice the future for now, then they're all going to be bankrupt in, in a few years. And so I think that's another aspect that maybe just in business in general could be applied more. Um, you know, business, the business of sports teams, they think about that. But in terms of like building a team to win, you know, it's not always winning now doesn't necessarily set you up for the future. Um, you kind of have to meld the two. How important is winning now? versus sacrificing the future, or how, how important is winning five years versus not being as good right now? We talk a lot lately about, say, player tracking in basketball, baseball, football. Um, you know, that's one sort of next frontier in sports analytics. Vikram, you talked about sort of on-court, the on-court taxonomy that, that you discussed. Uh, when we think about those things, are there actually uh, business conclusions you could draw from that I mean, very specifically game data that, that can influence things. Oh, very much so. I mean, I, I think that um, when we think about our fan segments, I mean, not only do we have an opportunity with our core fans to leverage some of the advances in statistics and scoring and everything that has to do with fantasy and 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 gaming and probably betting. But then I think, you know, the NBA in particular has all of these off the court assets again, back to the players and the personas of these players and the fashion statements that they make and the, the charity work and the advocacy, all of those things that are going on, the ability to also harness that type of data against, you know, more of the, the curious or the casual fan, I think is so powerful for the NBA. Um, I think it transcends even, in some cases, what's going on on the court. You certainly need that. That's the product. But there's just so much ancillary content that's being built up around these players and, and the teams that I think it's really powerful. I want to move to a couple questions we have from the audience. Um, and I'm just I'm going to adjust this one because it's very close to what you were just talking about. With the focus more on players in some leagues, like the NBA, uh, I know we know that like Paul mentioned, some fans switch allegiances based on where players go. Is, that, is there a historical difference now than compared to 15 years ago? I think so only because the economy, and I think people, Vikram can speak to this, but my sense is that um, people are more transient than they've ever been. Like we truly have, you know, have moved to a, a global economy. And I think the notion of, like, of out of market fans um, has never been more the case. I think we were talking about this earlier. You know, you sort of grow up in a, in a hometown and the team you watch, and then you end up going to college somewhere else and then, you know, having your own family and living maybe overseas. So I, I think that, uh, it, yeah, I think it's changed quite dramatically, not to mention for the NBA, the international footprint um, in, in markets, you know, including, you know, South America and China. Um, the opportunity is endless, I think, for us to really capitalize on a, a different fan and in some markets where there isn't a live game being played. I think, I think it's sports specific. I think the NBA definitely has changed. I mean, I don't have the data to back this up, but I think most of us would agree that the NBA is much different now than it was 15 years ago, to your point. I think other leagues don't have as much movement, so it's really hard to dissect you know, NFL, we'll see. Um, I don't know if Kirk Cousins has fans. Um, we'll see if they move. 
but my guess is that probably not as much um, in football as you, maybe in basketball. I mean, just to talk about business outcomes, a Jenna tweet yesterday destroyed $1.3 billion in Snapchat value, right? I mean, that shows you how the world has changed around the cult of the celebrity in a lot of ways, or the influencer community. And sports, I mean, is there an industry better set up for, an influence, so, so for influencers? And certainly the players uh, have walked right into it, right, as they should. I mean, in a lot of ways, they are all media companies now, in, in however you choose to define that. And certainly we think about that a lot at ESPN, sort of what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the notion of media? What does that mean for interaction with the fans? What does that mean for modalities? Like, when does it become one-on-one, -on -one, right? And what does that mean? Is it single cost to everybody? Is it one-on-one -on -one cost? Like, what happens between the fans? There are all kinds of new ways to engage today, and we're beginning to see more and more interactive routes. Social was the first start, but we'll see more, um, where you know, we go to haptic or we can go to other ways that people are going to interact. And you know, any future Imagineer who's thinking about sort of the ways that this could be is totally blown away by the possibility of what could be. Right? That's a perfect segue into another question that we got from the audience, which is, and this is for anyone, do, do you use real live data on social media platforms and analyze the text and then make or modify decisions based on that data? Um, not in as real time as I would like to be doing, but yeah, we are starting to do that quite powerfully. And I, and I, can't, I can't remember who said it earlier, but understanding um, fan sentiment in terms of how the game is progressing um, and frankly, how the team is doing overall throughout the season. You know, there's, there's a, a very common vernacular around net promoter score um, in, in other industries and this notion of customer sentiment. And I think that is very underutilized and undertapped. You know, I think there's a perception that, well, if my team is losing, the net promoter score is gonna be low, but yeah, that's the reality. So it's like understanding your fan sentiment. What do you do about that halfway through the season? Um, I think it's, it's just a hugely powerful tool. I think that you, you have to, you can't ignore. And I think using social sentiment um, is an amazing place to mine because people are having conversations not directly with the brand, but with each other mm -hmm. about uh, what's going on. And I think it's, it's very powerful information. Just to talk about some of our primary research, we run media labs where we actually bring fans in and we will watch them during a game. And when I say watch them, I mean really watch them. We do eye tracking, we, do, we look at heart rate sensing, essentially a map emotional state based on what's happening in the game, and then we map that back to our emotional map. So we're not guessing about this stuff. We're actually looking to see how we build essentially emotional maps around how people react to sport. Mm. We know their sports preferences, they go into that. I mean, and it's a bit of an artificial environment, right? They know they're being watched. Um, but now there's a camera that can do that. They can actually detect your, your pulse from across the room. Right? So you can start mapping these focus groups and find real world information around how people are reacting to sport in a very specific way. How we then build pieces around that, how we then take information from what's actually happening in the game and map that back to a variety of uses, it could certainly be in content. Um, I know at SportsCenter we certainly look at the tweets that are, that are going out and say you know, what's trending. There's a variety of commercially available applications today that put that together and allow the producers to think about how they want to change the rundown. There's, there's a bunch of ways that television is morphing because digital, it gives it more power. You know, certainly digital is evolving daily in terms of what is possible um, based on the interaction of information that comes from the fans. Uh, yeah, on the sports analytics team at ESPN, we've done a few social sort of engagement things, not necessarily live. Um, like Vikram was talking about, and one of our colleagues, Brian Burke, he tracked the NFL sentiment based on Twitter, you know, of every team throughout every week of the season. And it's interesting, and always the teams that are winning are always high. Sometimes the, you know, the Browns fans aren't always the lowest. They somehow seem to have eternal optimism. And, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, and we also have the, we, we did this fan happiness thing for college football as well, where, you know, Alabama, although, they win so much that their fans aren't always that happy. Um, and so it's interesting that you can, you know, they're not always directly correlated, winning and happiness, but there are they are correlated. Maybe that's Cleveland's problem. <laughs> <laughs> Another question here is, um, we've talked a lot about how much we can learn about the fans, learn about the consumers. The question is, do you consider the ethical implications of tracking people's actions and, and decisions so closely? Are there any ethical qualms that you have to waffle with? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, there's a lot of lines that we have to be careful with. Then ESPN and the Walt Disney Company that we're part of, we're, you know, we've always been very careful of that because how our guests, our fans think of us is paramount. Everything else is less important. So part of it is a, always doing the right thing in a situation where the question is which way would you go? Um, and the other piece, as the world evolves, is giving them value, right? Um, when you think about what people are willing to give up privacy or information for, it is hard value. And that interaction now has become very transactional. Like, they do it on Facebook every day, right? I want more information back from the social network, so I'm going to give you more information about who I am. The same way, we are doing much the same thing, which is we're asking them, what do you want? How personalized do you want your content to be? How specifically do you want us to know you? And there are so many places today where that happens on a daily basis. When you go to Amazon, when you go to Netflix, you are giving them information in return for high value. I used to do this thing at conferences where um, I used to talk about the creepiness of data. So why don't we play this game for a second? Will everyone just get up and turn to the person next to you? And I'm going to run a really quick game, right? So okay. introduce yourself. Hi, well, I'm Morris. Seth. Very nice to meet you. And I'm going to have you ask them five questions. You do not have to answer the questions. You just sort of think about how creepy they were, right? <laughs> the first thing that you're going to ask them is how old you are, right? Which a lot of Facebook will tell you. The next thing you're going to ask them is how much money they make, which you can buy pretty easily now from third-party vendors. The third thing you're going to ask them is, what were the last 10 things you bought online while you were alone? Because <laughs> somebody knows that. The next thing you're going to ask them is, what were the last 10 things you searched for online while you were alone? Much, much worse. And then, and then the last one is, what is your favorite sports team? Which one is the most creepy, right? Not the last. I used to do that with weather, too. Nobody cares about weather, either. It's great. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> I, you know, after, after that uh, exercise, <laughs> it, re it reminds me of a conversation I had with some of my family members recently. Um, I, you know, we recently got an Alexa for my kids at Christmas <laughs> yeah. because, you know, they love my son. He just loves asking it to play Star Wars music. Um, and, you know, one of my siblings, you know, they're much, you know, a lot of people are concerned about privacy and things like that. And they're like, well, are you okay with, like, Jeff Bezos listening in on your home? And I was like, well... It, you know, he's not listening to everything, but you have to trust that Amazon's, you know, there's an agreement, and you have to trust that they're going to do what they're going to do. Likewise, with, with data that you, every online activity you ever do is, is being tracked by companies, and, and it's valuable. I mean, I think for most people would agree that the benefit of people having your data and the data that tracking what you do online and things like that way outweighs the, the small chance that maybe someone's going to abuse that power. I want to ask Paul, uh, you this question. We talk a lot about having more data, and the more data we can acquire, the more information we can learn about people, the better decisions we can make. Someone wanted to know, can you think of a decision where uh, the overwhelming amount of data in a sports situation led to the incorrect decision? Um, it's very specific, but you can blame the person in the audience. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so. Here, I'll give, I'll give an example. So, you know, I run an NBA draft model and, uh, and try to combine scouts rankings and, um, you know, data based on the t players and, the, you know, their seasons in college and things like that. And a couple years ago, you know, weren't too high in Ben Simmons. Uh, you know, they didn't follow, the Sixers didn't listen to us. Um, they, they still drafted Ben Simmons. They, he wasn't number one. I think he's like number two on our, on our ratings, I think. Um, you know, and you know he probably was the best player. I, you know, I won't definitively say that, but oftentimes data, you know, data is probabilities. You know, and no data is going to tell you 100% of the time um, that something is going to turn out a certain way. And you can follow the probabilities, and you can try to maximize your likelihood of success. Um, but you know, when the probabilities are only 40%, then 40%, you know, or a 6% increase on ad sales is huge. You, you might miss a few people, but overall, usually when you follow the data, you're, you're better off. But yeah, you're going to have some misses. Is, that's an interesting point, because it's something that uh, we are trying to communicate to readers all the time, and people I'm always battling with on Twitter are trying to understand. Do you guys in the business world have to also convey that when you say, if we take this approach, it will lead, there's a 60% chance it will lead to an increase in revenue? I mean, there's a 40% chance it will lead, it will not. 
Yep. Uh, is that something that's hard to convey? I mean, one of the joys of being commercially relevant is you don't have to be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And so you are constantly testing. I mean, the dirty truth to data, and everybody who works in it knows that, is that it's dirty. Like, it, it often spits out incorrect answers. It will ask, sometimes give you the answer, depending on the question you ask it, that's completely different from the next question you ask it. Um, it's almost never organized in a way that initially is helpful. So sort of going through all of those things, you realize there's no perfect data model. There's no perfect data question, right? You're constantly optimizing to a better future with data. Um, and so, yes, you will often run into situations where you have to decide what your ability to be accurate means, right? And if the fidelity means you can't do the thing, then you can't do the thing, because then it would be stupid to do it. Very often, you can do the thing, right? Knowing that the thing will get better over time, whether that's predicting who will win a game, predicting how somebody will feel about the game being won, whatever it might be. And then, in the end, what's the action? In, in our case, in that case of that product I talked about earlier, we're going to serve an ad, right? Now, is that... Is the, is the end user going to know exactly why the ad was served? No, right? Is he or she going to do something about it? Maybe. And if the percentage of them doing something about it rises, you win. And you keep doing it. Yeah. I think that's, we didn't talk much about it, but I, that to me is key. Like the, the ability to test and take a minimally viable product approach means that you're using what you, you, know, you believe to be 50, 60%, and then you're testing it in the market to give you confidence that that's actually what's happening. And based on that, you, you go deeper. It's not sort of an all-in approach. And I think that's another area that I was talking to my team about last night. Like, there's some things that we know. We always have a pipeline of experiments going. And based on those, it's like, OK, yes, we believe we're going all in. And then there's some things that you just you continue to test and iterate. And it, it becomes a lot more of a um, strategic, ongoing approach to how you do business, as opposed to kind of going all in where the risk is, is going to be tremendous if, if that 40% plays out. That's, that's one of the advantages of a business is that you, you can have a test population. In sports, there's no really, you know, you can tell a coach to test a quarter of the game and doing things a different way. I mean, that's, that's a tough sell. But um, maybe in practice or something like yeah. that, you could do that. But in business, you know, there's a lot of those things that you can do that maybe you can't always translate into the sports. We're just about to wrap up, but I wanted to just circle back to something that, uh, Vikram, you said earlier, the insurance example of right before a, an evenly matched game, people buy insurance. What, I guess, you know, and this, this does speak to some, one of the other questions, what else do you, do you know about us, and what, you know, what are some <laughs> of the other actionable things that, uh, that you can use for you, you or Doris? Uh, what about last 10 searches? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wish I knew that. That's, we'd build a whole different kind of model, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, it is very specific by category, right? And, and we, we've actually found that there are different half-lives for different reactions. So um, a win, so in college, in college sport in general, like the half-lives are super quick. You know, people are constantly changing how they feel about things, whereas in some of the more professional leagues, they, they tend to extend out in different ways. So we are constantly trying to examine, here are the things that we think people are reacting to. How long does that last? Does it last the day? Does it last an hour? Does it last until the next game? Does it last deep into the season? And what does that depend on? What are all the variables that feed into it? So we're building pretty sophisticated models to try and understand how people feel, which, you know, and there are lots of other things that we're dropping into that to try and sort of build that better notion of how people are reacting to it. And what's interesting for us as part of ESPN is we're also then building that into a Disney model where we're actually looking at a bunch of other things, right? So sports becomes this really interesting, sort of highly variable emotive state that, that we can use to predict behavior. It's, it's kind of awesome. And there are a bunch of things. And uh, if you want to ask about them, we can definitely talk. But you'd have to make a media buy along with it. <laughs> Great. Doris, Paul, Vikram, thank you all very much. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.